Um, we are focusing on or making inroads, if not specifically about healing, definitely um, healing is the subject for the season. And uh, we taught on healing and offenses a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Prophet Linda taught on healing and uh, last week, two major points, if, if you remember them. If you weren't here and you don't remember them, either way, you want to write this down. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That was a major point. A, 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 a big, major point of purpose for why Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil. Sickness, disease, and physical infirmity Mental illness, all of these things are works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy them. How does he destroy them? Through this thing we call healing. Amen? And number two, Jesus, his motivation was he was moved with compassion. He cares about this. He, he, he loves us enough to care about our health and our healing. And I think sometimes we can have a religious notion that the only thing that is important is uh, eternal salvation. But that word salvation actually means deliverance from all that is evil. And if it's eternal salvation, it's not just about the future, it's about the here and the now, and the healing of the past. Eternal salvation. In other words, if you say you believe in eternal salvation, we're not just talking about being born again and living with Jesus forever. We're talking about being delivered from all that is evil throughout the course of our life. Healing is a work of the devil. It's evil. Sick, or sickness and disease is a work of the devil. Glad, glad I... I came out of my mouth and suddenly I went, oh, on the inside, you got to fix that. Yeah. Healing is a work of Jesus. It's a work of the Spirit. It's something that the Father has given to us. Amen? Amen. So, last week, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And God really cares about this stuff. In other words, so should we. So should we. We are, we are to desire spiritual gifts. Right? The, the scripture encourages us, exhorts us to desire spiritual gifts. Is healing one of those spiritual gifts? Yes. It is. It is. God cares about it. Jesus expressed God's heart for us to be healed. He cared about it. He was moved with compassion. Uh, so the question then is, winding up last week, Am I moved with compassion when I see someone struggling with their health? <laughs> it's, it, you know, there, there's, I, I want to move off this point, but I just can't move off it quite yet. There is tradition and religion that says they made their bed, now they got to sleep in it. What's it to me? Man, that is not the heart of Jesus. And if we think like that, we should be ashamed. So we want the Lord to adjust our hearts. Amen? That was last week. This week, the, message, the title of this message is Healing is Easy. Healing is Easy. Let's just say that together if you want. It might be a little risky for you to say that. You might not know if you really believe that yet, but you know... Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So uh, sometimes our, our mouth follows our heart, and at other times our heart follows our mouth. Amen? So let's just say it together. Healing is easy. Now we can, we can add a prepositional phrase on the end of that sentence. We can say, well, for God. Well, yeah. Duh. But oftentimes we don't really believe that because... The Bible says that those early disciples went out doing good, the Lord working with them. It was easy for them because they knew it was easy for God. And if you don't think it's easy for us to walk in healing, 
to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. If you don't think that's easy, it's because you really don't think it's easy for God. Because it's not you anyways. It's God working through you. And so our major hindrances to walking in healing as something easy is fear, primarily the fear of man, unbelief, number two, and your tradition, number three. These sins, fear, unbelief, and trusting in your tradition more than the word of God, those are sins. And these sins specifically, and sin in general, are often the obstacles to health. The Bible says, these signs shall follow. Here again, this is, the, this is some of the tie-in with the Great Commission. These signs shall follow those who believe. Jesus said, in my name, the name of Jesus, we sang about that this morning, right? The power, the wonder in the name of Jesus. You know the word wonderful means filled with wonders? What's supposed to follow us? Signs, wonders, miracles. Our life is meant to be something that people observe the power that you are walking in, Holy Spirit power, and say, boy, I wonder about that one. A wonder is something that causes someone to wonder, to become curious, to, to question. It's an attention getter. These signs will follow you. Say me. 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 Cast out demons. This is to be normal for you. Go ahead and say me again. Normal for me. Cast out demons. Speak in tongues. Lay hands on the sick. And see them recover. One, two, three, four. Cast out demons, speak in tongues, yeah, languages, glossolalia. I don't know, people don't like the word tongues because they get all hung up on it, but be hung up on it. Let, let it irritate you. Let it be a burn to your saddle. You need to be praying in tongues more than you are. I can tell you that right now. Paul credited his praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit for his success. He says, look, I pray in tongues more than you all. Quit being surprised. At the power that I walk in. I pray in tongues more than you all. And he, he said that, I think it was to the Corinthians, didn't he? And these people were crazy about tongues. They were so crazy about tongues, Paul encouraged them to get their lives in order in the, in the use of spiritual gifts. I really get a kick out of how many charismatics, Pentecostals they call themselves, who are apologetic about tongues. It's like, you got to be kidding me. It's part of the Great Commission. Cast out demons. Speak in glossolalia. Lay hands on the sick. And see them recover. Are you a believer? Yes. Then let's say this together. This is my job description. <laughs> to lay hands on the sick. And see them recover. And I'll say this next. Easy. Nothing difficult about that. Easy. <laughs> we always wrap these kind of things in some humor because it's easier to swallow. The baptism of the Spirit is a baptism of power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You want to write that down or turn there so you've got it crystal clear. Now look, this teaching today is one that you probably want to spend time reviewing every day the rest of your life. Not just this week. But this is one of those, when you get home, take your notes, maybe scribble some of them in the back of your Bible so that you've got them for perpetuity, that, that you, can, you can look at this. Because this is a basis for our belief in Jesus. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You will receive power. That word power 
is the word dunamis or dynamis. It's where we get our word, obviously, dynamite. Explosive force and power. That word, any time in the New Testament you see the word miracle, it's the same word. It's the same word. For some reason, the translators wrapped it up in the word miracle, I think, because it sounded a little bit more religiously appropriate, which irritates the fool out of me. The gifts of the Spirit are... No, that's the fruit. Close. There's nine of those and there's nine of the others. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? Against these things, there's no law. We can function in the fruit of the Spirit without any legal recourse. The gifts of the Spirit are tongues, interpretation, prophecy. There's nine of them. But, but the two I want us to look at is healings and gift of miracles, powers. The manifestation of Holy Spirit powers to bring about certain effects or changes in people's lives. That power can be clothing, encapsulating your words into someone's life. You can speak words powerfully or you can speak them so they just ricochet around the room and don't do a darn thing. I want my words to be powerful. I want my counsel and my advice to be Holy Spirit anointed with power. Okay? Power. Mir miraculous. If you say to a mountain, be moved and cast into the sea, how many of you would like your, your words to be powerful? Whatever that mountain is you're speaking to. Why, why, why would you want to just speak a bunch of air? We want it to be clothed in Holy Spirit power. So the workings of powers is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says, My gospel I came preaching, not merely in word, or eloquence of speech, another translation says, but with demonstrations of the Holy Spirit and power. Another translation, another translation says, with demonstrations of Holy Spirit power. It leaves out the word and, which is arguable. Either way, Paul's preaching was accompanied with power. Visible power. There, there were visible effects and manifestations that it, there was power attached to it. He came preaching, a snake jumps out of, the, out of the wood that didn't want to get thrown into the fire, bites him, it's a viper, it's a poisonous snake. Everyone's waiting for him to drop dead, but he just shook it off. Holy Spirit demonstration of power. A guy that should have died didn't die. I've got a friend of this ministry who lived here when the military base was here. I don't know how long ago it was, maybe 10 years ago even now. I'm not, I don't even remember. He now lives in Michigan. His father-in-law was in the hospital on a respirator during the COVID crisis. And they were telling the family, we just need to unplug the respirator and let him die. He's, he's a goner. So this fella calls here and says, I know that when that church prays, the power of God manifests itself. Can you pray for my father-in-law that God will raise him up? We did. God raised him up. He walked out. That hospital said he was the only guy that has been on a respirator that walked out alive. I, what's that? Power. It's Holy Spirit power. How is it released? When you lay a hold of something by faith, power is released. 
We laid our hands on that, figuratively speaking, in prayer. We said, yes, we will pray. He called, he asked, we prayed. What did it result in? The salvation of that man. He was saved from death, but he was a witness of the power of God coming upon his body, healing him, strengthening him, delivering him, and he gave his life to Jesus. God healed an unbeliever because of the faith of other people. Praise God. Power. Holy Spirit power. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Paul reminds the Thessalonians, the gospel came to you in power. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts 10, 38. Jesus was anointed with the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and he was anointed with power. Jesus was anointed with power. Wow. The power of God is an anointing. You know people who anoint themselves with perfume. And you go, oh, that's such a sweet smell. But then if you're having a struggle with consciousness... A sports trainer, rather than popping over a bottle of perfume, he could pop open a bottle of smelling salts. And wave that under your noise. There is an anointing of power. There's anointings of pleasure. There's anointings of convenience. There's anointings of this or that. But there is something called, in Christ, an anointing with power. You want that. And you can't have it apart from being filled with the Spirit. Those two phrases, those two words are always together. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world, great commission, but, and it's probably the most powerful word in the scripture, but don't leave home until you're filled with power. You're filled with the Holy Spirit and his power. There's a couple of scriptures we'll look at here about hindrances to this power or hindrances to you and me walking in this power. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This talks about the power of God was available to heal, but because they were familiar, that familiarity which led to them being scandalized, offended with Jesus. Isn't this just the carpenter's son? Pfft. This guy's nothing special. Hey, let me tell you something. When you walk into a room where there are needs and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and power, you're something special. You are a gift to those people whose room you just walked into. Jesus walked in, anointed with the spirit and power to heal them, and they were offended because they were familiar with him. Eh, it's, just, it's just Jesus, the carpenter's son. Oh, it's just Susie, the baker's daughter. Oh, it's just Jim. The mechanic guy, you know, down the road, it's his boy. Nothing special. No. When you walk in the Spirit, anointed with power, you're special. You're not just special ideologically to God because you're his kid. The Spirit of Christ rests upon you, and that makes you not just special, it makes you glorious, the Bible says. As Christians, we need to realize the preciousness of what God has bestowed upon us. He has put glory in us. Sure, we're just earthen vessels. 
But if you're a vessel that carries glory, there's something special about you. And you need to be confident in that. You're a spirit-filled believer. You are the answer to someone's question. You are the solution to someone's problem. That's pretty doggone special. And if they don't recognize it, it's their loss. But our faith, our expectation is that God would open their eyes so that when you say, oh, can I pray for you? Oh, like at a restaurant. Oh, I see you're struggling here. Is it okay if I pray with you? Oh, yeah, I don't see why not. Can I just put my hand on your shoulder while I pray? Laying hands on the sick. It's yours and my job description. Why? You should have every confidence. Healing for God, and therefore healing for me, because it's not me, it's the God who fills me. Easy. We all need to have an easy button again, don't we? Remember that, remember that Staples commercial? <clears throat> That's easy. It should be like that for us as believers when it comes to healing. And equally so with deliverance. Deliverance isn't a wrestling match with demons. It could be. But it's not necessary that it is. Amen? Eh, easy. Okay, what well, I give you? Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. Let me give you now a, 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 very, a very also uh, similar scripture. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26 for the whole Context, And I give you that, even though we're not going to look at all of it, we're just going to take the core of it out, but so that you can study it, because uh, a believer who doesn't study the word is it's not worth their salt. You've got to be students of the word, amen? Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee. You know when the Bible says every town, the Bible's not using that kind of, the way we use it. You know, we use it kind of gratuitously, don't we? Oh, everyone knows. No, everyone doesn't know the way we use the word every. But when the scripture says every, it means every without exception. It really means every. And there were Yeah, you've got a different translation than I do, but that's good. I have the New King James here. It happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and from Jerusalem itself. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, when the Bible translators deal with grammar, they're, they're, they want us to first get the gist of what is being said. But then the way you arrange the words can also emphasize a certain meaning that is particular, specific. I like the New King James because I think it translates this the most accurately to the way it's written. And it says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. It wasn't just the presence of the Lord uh, was, was present so that he could heal, but so that he could heal them. Who? The scribes, the Pharisees. The leaders of the nation that were there, present, I think this is in Capernaum, they traveled all that way to a private meeting with Jesus, and the power of God was there with the intention of healing them. His critics, his opposition, you know this guy on Michigan that got healed when we prayed? He was a skeptic. He wasn't, he wasn't a churchgoer. He wasn't a God lover. But God so loved him, when God saw his situation, 
He moved on the heart of a son-in-law to call you and me to pray for him. He was moved with compassion for him, put it on someone's heart who made a phone call. Jesus loved these guys. He cared about them, and the power of the Spirit was ready to manifest in healing them. But the outcome is they were familiar with him. And even though God was there to heal them, God's will has been made known to all mankind. It is always God's will to heal and that we walk in health. Always. But what happened? What could override the will of God for these knuckleheads? Their unbelief, their familiarity, their tradition. Matthew 13, verses 55 through 58. Matthew 13, verses 55 through 58. Jesus could not heal this group of people in Matthew chapter 13. The Bible clearly says, because of their unbelief. Not because of God's willingness to heal, but in spite of him being willing, ready. It's like God being like this. The wind up. Here comes the pitch. And right here, unbelief. Made, overrode God's will. Well, we've got this fancy, dumb doctrine that pervades the modern church that says, well, if God wills it, then it's going to happen. That's not faith. That's fatalism. That's whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That whatever happens must be God's will. Whatever the outcome is, it must be God's will. Baloney! That's a lie. That's a heresy. That mars the character and nature of God. It hinders people from receiving what God has for them in the kingdom by people who are usually gatekeepers of the kingdom themselves. Jesus spoke this judgment over that kind of stuff. He says, not only do you not enter in, but you obstruct others from entering in. You're doubly cursed. We don't want to be those people. Settle it in your heart. When Jesus sees sickness and disease and infirmity, he's moved with compassion. To do what? To heal it. It is, he is always, say always, always moved with compassion. Always ready to heal. Always looking to fix and rectify whatever's broken so that healing can come forth. Remember the kid that was thrown in the fire when Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration? He encounters his disciples in a group of the public. And the guy has a, it's called a lunatic son, if you look it up in the King James. And, and he says, uh, my, my son, this, this spirit seizes him and throws him into the fire and he probably foamed at the mouth and twitched and jerked in the whole nine yards. And, and uh, your disciples could not cast it out. And Jesus says, it's, it's because of unbelief. And the man cries out, Lord, help my unbelief. What did Jesus do? Say, oh, you know, you made your bed, you're going to sleep in it. You're not in a place of faith right now. And right now, this is the time. And oh, you missed your opportunity. The window has closed. Sorry, pal. No. When he cried out and identified what was missing and asked Jesus for help, how was Jesus moved? Again, he's moved with compassion, met the need, dealt with the man's unbelief, and healed the boy. It says, no longer be unbelieving, but believe. How did he minister to the unbelief? With a demonstration of Holy Spirit power. Because that's how Jesus operated. He didn't operate as God during his earthly walk. The Bible clearly says in Philippians, he emptied himself of everything that made him God and came as a servant and then at his baptism, he was filled with the Spirit and now he functioned in Holy Spirit power. A human, just like you and me, 
filled with the Spirit. Jesus could only do what he did by Holy Spirit demonstrations of power. But the good news is, if he did it, he's the firstborn among many brethren. He's our older brother. If he can, you can. And for Jesus, he said this, it's easy. There's a time where Jesus, I'm going to try to look for it here in my field. Here it is, Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Matthew 9, 1 through 8. Jesus says to a paralyzed guy, hey, your sins are forgiven. Everyone went crazy. Ooh, who, are, who are you to have the power to forgive sins? And he says, well, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk? Be healed. Rise up and walk. In other words, just as easy as it is for you to forgive someone of their offense against you, it's just as easy for you to function in Holy Spirit power and healing for them. You can release them from their offense or you can release them from their sickness and their disease. Now, what their posture is, all you have to do is wind up and pitch. That's all you have to do. Easy. Jesus said, what's easier? He used the word easy. To say, you know what? Yeah, I forgive you. Will you forgive me, please? Will you forgive me? Sure, I forgive you. Easy. Of course, i got to posture myself. i got to examine my heart. Jesus said, you know, you don't just forgive people. You have to forgive your brother from your heart. Right? So you have to, you know, do some introspection and... Okay, you might have to do some work. Weighing this out. Usually that work is a season of bargaining with God. Well, Lord, I don't really want to forgive them because they really did hurt me. And I'm wondering if I forgive them, are you going to do something about it? And, 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 and eventually the answer is from God, it's none of your business. Uh, how I do my job, says God, is none of your business. You just do your job. Work it out. Work it through. Chug along. Which is easier? To forgive someone or to heal somebody? Thank you. Jeremiah 32 is a song that I grew up singing. And it has that phrase, Jeremiah 32, 27. Nothing is too difficult for you, O Lord. Nothing is too difficult for you. Oh, nothing is too difficult for you. Lord my God. Da, 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 da. And mighty indeed, mighty indeed. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing is too difficult for you. Uh, that's Jeremiah 32, 27. This stuff is not difficult for God. I want to give you a very graphic, and it'll be annoying to my wife. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's, it's, well, I can limit the graphicness, but, but yeah, the whole idea is. But it's 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 what Jesus said. So, um, let me give you another scripture: Mark chapter seven, verses nine through thirteen. Uh, this scripture talks about uh, that there is, there, is, there is power to accomplish certain things, but there's only one thing that can make the word of God of none effect, and that is your traditions, Jesus said. And that's found in Mark chapter 7, verses 9 through 13. Now, your traditions are your old ways. Your old ways of thinking and your old ways of doing things. We, 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 we taught a few weeks ago on wineskins. Yeah, that, that, that word would fit too. If you're trying to fit what God is doing today in your wineskin from yesterday, uh, it's not going to work. You're going to have to change some things. Okay, so let me wrap up with this. With this, and I think this morning we would like to present ourselves to the Lord in a ministry time where we are saying, Lord, fill me 
afresh with your spirit. That is the hinge that this whole door of healing and deliverance turns upon. Being filled with the spirit. Being continually filled with the spirit. So that as we're filled with the spirit fresh again, asking the Lord, Lord, wherever the holes are in my spiritual life, where, you know, we don't, we, we want our, we want our hearts to be like bowls that have the ability to hold what God pours into us, right? But there's something that is very bowl-shaped that's full of holes. It's called a colander or a sieve. And sometimes in our lives, God in his goodness, he pours into us the very thing we're asking for because he's good all the time. And if we ask him, he'll give it to us. But it lands into, in, into an unprepared vessel that it just weeps right out of us. Sometimes in a matter of minutes, sometimes in a matter of days or weeks. So we, as we receive a fresh infilling of the Spirit, we also want the Lord to give us wisdom and understanding and knowledge and, um, so that whatever holes are in my life are not, are not, are not the obstacle. How can a hole be an obstacle, right? But it can't, that it wouldn't be the reason that we continue to walk a powerless life again this week or next week when we've just today been filled with the Spirit fresh. Forgiveness, all that kind of stuff. Those are holes in our bowl. And uh, we want the Lord to speak to our hearts as how we can successfully walk in the power of the Spirit. Amen? So, healing and deliverance are easy. Jesus, uh, in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, he's talking about deliverance and healing. And he says, how many of you know, oftentimes healing comes as an act of deliverance. You are delivered from a sickness or a disease. Or there is a demonic spirit that has attached itself to our lives that is the gatekeeper of that sickness or that, that disease. And the result of being delivered is health and restoration. So Jesus is talking to these guys and they're, they're accusing him of casting out spirits by Beelzebub, you know, the Lord of the Flies, and casting out demons by the power of other demons. And Jesus says this, he says, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, okay, everybody look, if I cast out demons this easy, with a flick of the finger, surely the kingdom of God has come near you. That's why when we go into all the world and preach the gospel, signs and wonders are following, what kind of signs and wonders? Casting out demons, laying hands on healing the sick, forgiving those who have offended us, which is easier. The reason he does this is this is the universal signal that follows this. It's as easy as picking your nose. Seriously. That is the spiritual interpretation of that scripture. See, didn't I tell you this would, this, this would really, excuse the pun, nauseate my wife. This is how easy it is. <laughs> Removal of an obstacle. <laughs> uh, you, you may need to roll it, but then you <laughs> flick it. <laughs> flick it. See, this, is, this, this input is important. You're getting it. You're getting it. Yeah. For Jesus, that's what he's saying. For me to cast out spirits by the Spirit of God, it's this easy. <laughs> Just a flick of the finger. Done. 
But if you don't, the next phrase is, but if you don't deal with those holes in the sieve, he's going to come back with seven more. And your condition will be worse. So there is the sieve, there is the faith, there is the power. But then we also want to be mindful, and this is probably a whole other teaching, we're not going to go there today, that we have to pay attention to this right here, this vessel. This is important. This inner vessel is a temple. It holds glory, it holds power, it holds wonder. It's special. It's not common. <laughs> it's hard to take anything I say seriously after that, isn't it? All right. All right. What's that? It's good that wrapping up. Yeah, it's my wrapping up point. And then these broadcasts go into natural, uh, go international into other speaking nations. But I tell you, that's universal. You don't have to, it doesn't matter if you, it's English, Spanish, Italian, French. Amen. All right, are we ready to stand? <laughs> Might as well stretch yourself out after that. Amen. Okay, so the name of this message is Healing is Easy. It's not healing as easy as flicking a booger. It's healing is easy. So don't, don't reveal the punchline till the end. Amen. We need to be continuously filled with the Spirit. Amen. Not just filled once. The same folks who were filled in Acts chapter 2 were in a time of prayer and seeking the Lord. An earthquake came, I think it was Acts chapter 4, and that same group that got filled in Acts chapter 2 got filled again in Acts chapter 4. What does that tell us? That God's plan for us is not just to fill us, but to keep us filled with the Spirit. Amen? To keep us in a life that is dependent upon Him, honoring Him, and not just asking Him for stuff, but working with him, flowing with him as he stirs us, that out of our bellies would flow rivers of living water. Amen? They went about doing good, the Bible says to those early disciples, the Lord working with them and through them. That's our heart. That's the purpose. That's why we are filled with the Spirit, that our lives would be powerful, that your words would be powerful. That your prayers would be powerful. That your declarations and prophecies would be powerful. That your good deeds would be powerful. Not just a good deed, but something that is anointed with power. Eye-opening, ear-opening power. Amen? So we're just going to open the altar up. And if you would like to find a place to stand or uh, by coming forward, you're basically saying, yeah, I would like... I would like prayer and agreement for a fresh filling of the Spirit. You can get that anytime, anywhere. But this morning, so that we know who would like prayer, we're going to ask you to identify yourself by coming forward. Amen? And so, um, let's go ahead and thank you. I was going to say, put on some background music to help us not be distracted. Let's just close our eyes. Lord, we want to move by the, by the urging of your spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that when Jesus sent you, apostelloed you to the earth, we thank you that you came. And we thank you that you are forever faithful. And that when you encounter us, you always bring gifts, anointings. A sweet smelling aroma. We thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. And that you are eager to look at our condition, to be like Jesus, move with compassion for us, and saying, oh, you're asking for more of me? As earthly fathers, when your sons and daughters ask for fish or bread, 
I don't give them a stone or a scorpion, how much more will the Father give the Spirit to those who simply ask? Lord, we're asking for a fresh filling of your Spirit. Holy Spirit power to live lives that are pleasing to you and obedient to you concerning the Great Commission, not just to foreign nations and mission fields, but in our everyday life. Thank you. Thank you for your promise. The Holy Spirit power, these signs shall follow me. Holy Spirit power.